Take your Bibles, if you would, open with me to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. This session is entitled Rewards for uh, Faithfulness and Service. And this, uh, it's interesting. I think it was developed this way, I'm sure, by the Lord and in the hearts of the people who planned the, the sessions. But uh, Pastor Sean, if you're here, Pastor Sean's opening session, he actually called me because he wanted to cover some of these parables. And I told him, well, I'm, I'm going to be working on this one. And so he, he uh, touched upon the kind of twin parable in Matthew 25. That one is the parable of the talents. And uh, we'll, we'll just mention a passing. They're, they are parallel. They give some similar things. Uh, I think he called them servant passages, uh, faithfulness and service. Uh, I often refer to these as stewardship uh, pa parables, a sim similar concept. And uh, several of these are really dealing with uh, service, uh, stewardship, preparation for the kingdom. So this is one of those kingdom parables. Uh, I love working in the parables. They're challenging. Of course, they're interesting stories in their own right. But to kind of get at them and dig into them is to spend some time with the Lord and in his teaching. And so we want to look at this one. This is the, the parable of the pounds, or I'm reading on the ESV today, the, the minas. Uh, that's just the, that's kind of the Greek word underlying. It's been transliterated in some of our trans, uh, translations. And so we're going to read that. This, the account starts in verse, uh, verse 11. I'm going to back up just a verse or two. And um, before we read it, the kind of the central idea, you don't need to turn there, but there is a reminder from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 when we're talking about servants of the Lord, and in particular, stewardship. Stewardship is an accountable position, and uh, th these, this is one of those stewardship passages. But in 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 and 2, Paul words it this way, let a man so account of us as of uh, ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of, of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found Faithful. That's the main requirement. That seems to be the main metric. Um, but we'll, we'll explore this a little bit. Let me read the parable for you. Uh, this, is, uh, this occurs uh, in Luke 19, uh, right before the triumphal entry. In fact, I'm going to read one verse past this paragraph, and you'll see that he's going to go into Jerusalem, what we call the triumphal entry. And uh, so this is in the final week, uh, however, you, however you do, Good Friday, Good Thursday, Good Wednesday, whatever it might be. We're in the final week before the death of Christ, and a lot of things are going to happen, and this is one of those parables. So allow me to read it. I'm not going to begin in verse 1. That's the story of Zacchaeus. You remember him, the short guy that climbed the tree and all that. Um, but I'll pick it up in verse 8. This is the end of that. So verse 8, Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And then our story, as they heard these things, that's why I began, as, they, as that story wrapped up, as that encounter with Zacchaeus, and as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable why? Because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, engage in business. I, I still enjoy the old King James, occupy, occupy till I come. Uh, do business for me. Uh, engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know wh what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him and uh, saying, Lord, your mine has, has made 10 minas more. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minus. And he said to him, and you are to be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Lord, here's your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. 
For I was afraid of you because you're a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. We have, again, uh, one of these kingdom parables. This is in the final Passion Week. Uh, as, and the next verse is going to be when he had said these things, he went ahead going up to Jerusalem. But the, the story before us lays out another one of these stewardship uh, parables. It involves stewards or slaves, servants. Uh, to whom is granted authority to work for the master, or in this case a nobleman, while he is away uh, to receive a kingdom. And there is some parallel. The, the, some of the truths between this and Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, uh, some of the parallel teachings, principles, have to do with uh, accountability to God, accountability to the master of his servants, um, and, and, the, and the seriousness of it. There's a seriousness and a great joy for those who are faithful. In both of them, faithfulness is the, the main center. They also diverge. I don't have time to cover both of them, but there are some interesting things. They are two different parables. Uh, for one thing, the parable of the talents is given into the week. It's up on the Mount of Olives. It's during the Olivet Discourse. And so it's a few days later. It's not the same exact parable. Uh, uh, parable. Um, and then there are a few other details that are teaching, are giving some other things. In this one, each of the ten servants is given the same ability, the same amount, one mina, one, one pound. In that one, they are given uh, ten, uh, I'm sorry, five, two, and one uh, talents. And so there's a varying, and there's a different lesson for that. So in this, there is some aspect of describing God's servants or stewards, which is pretty pretty clear to me and what we're presenting here that's dealing with you and me we we fit into that category of those 10 servants and in, and in some sense we are all given the same that's what this parable deals with and we are given a responsibility to serve the master with what he has given us and then we give an accounting and so there's there's some similarities but differences we're going to deal with this one uh this one today just to give you an idea of the sense here, again, with the two, the two parables, uh, in, the, in the monetary system of that day, uh, the typical beginning point, one of the smaller units, modestly small units of money was a drachma, a drachma. And that would have been equivalent to about uh, a working, uh, a, a day's labor, a day's wage for a working man. And so one drachma, what, if you had 100 drachmas, if you had 100 drachmas, 100 days wages, that would equal one mina. So what is given out here to each of these is a, is a reasonable amount of money. Again, I hate to put it in terms because they're different, uh, differently hourly rates, different wages, on, but approximately three months, 100 days of wages, a, a goodly amount. Um, again, our, we're not dealing with Matthew 25, but to give it a comparison, um, there were uh, 60 minas in a talent, 60 minas in a talent. So one talent uh, would be about 100, and if you do the math, about 180 months or 15 years of wages. So the servant that received five talents in that parable, we're talking about 75 years uh, worth of wages approximately. So whatever you make or you know, whatever standard in our economy, Think about earning, being handed 75 years. That's more or less, that's more or less two lifetimes of work for a, for a standard worker and being said, take two lifetimes of work and go do business. That's Matthew 25. We're in Luke here. And so we're in, in interested in this one, the pounds or the minas. Each of the 10 servants receives one, same amount. And, uh, and uh, here's what's going on. So in Luke uh, 19, verse 11, um, 
They had just left Zacchaeus' household, and the purpose of the parable, the purpose of the parable, uh, has to do with Jesus' proximity to Jerusalem. He has, I think it's back in Luke chapter 12, he, a few weeks before this, he had already set his face uh, steadfastly, I think is the wording, for, towards Jerusalem. He is headed there to die. He has been announcing that to the disciples for a bit. Uh, I'm going, the Son of Man is going to go up to Jerusalem. He's going to be handed over to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and so on. And they will, they will, uh, uh, they will beat him and, and uh, harass him and they will put him to death. And, and we have that in, in Matthew and in the other. Luke mentions the steadfastness of his determination to get there. And, of course, you remember Peter's response was what? <laughs> when that was first announced, he's, it's an, actually, it's a, if, you, if, you re, if you get the humor of it, Peter's statement when Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. I'm going to be handed over. Peter said what? Not so, Lord. <laughs> I always find that interesting. I mean, the not so, he just needs to be instructed. He's wrong. But the final word is Lord. Lord means what? Lord, master, boss. You're in charge, but I'm telling you, you're not going to do what you're saying you're going to do. It's just, it, there's a little funny catch there. Um, anyways, that, and Jesus corrects him. So we've now come to this. He's outside. He's headed up the hill, up the road to Jerusalem in this parable. And he is telling it in order to dispel the notions uh, you know, that they think maybe he's not going to die. He is. That he's going to leave this place. And more than that, more than that, he tells it, verse 11, he was near Jerusalem, and because the people, the disciples included, supposed they had con their conclusion was that he was going to have the kingdom of God appear immediately. Uh, side note, but important, on these on these uh, kingdom parables, that was a major issue that the disciples worked through. Um, when they came to understand Jesus is the Messiah, the promised coming one, uh, the, the, the predicted king, their assumption that when he was born and then, and then they got to know him, here he is in public ministry, and they come to realize this kind of a John 2.11 thing, put their faith in him as Messiah, uh, they assume, they suppose that the kingdom of God was going to appear. And just a little, that's a little side study, but uh, how long did they hold on to this notion that the kingdom was coming right away? <laughs> oh, well, it's, it's here, that's why he's given this parable. How about, it, how about at the cross? Well, that one really threw him. What's, you know, we, we, if you remember Luke 24, the road to Emmaus, uh, we thought this is the one who was coming and the kingdom would appear. You know, that's in the conversation with the, re the resurrected Christ. But how about all the way into the book of Acts, chapter 1, at the ascension, Jesus is getting ready to ascend. What is their question? Is the kingdom of God going to at this time appear? And he, even then, after resurrection, 50 day, uh, 40 days after, uh, says, it's not for you to know the times or seasons. So anyways, he, the, that's one of the big issues that is, that is put out here in, in re relationship to the kingdom itself uh, is the need to understand that it is going to be delayed. And this, this also is probably a Matthew 13, the mysteries of the kingdom parables. One of the mysteries, mysteries meaning had not yet been disclosed, hadn't been told in the Old Testament, is that there is going to be a delay between the announcement of the kingdom and it's actual being inaugurated, actually set up and started. And that's the period here. That's what this is about. And so we are, we're working on that. He calls the 10 servants. He, the, he, the nobleman is going to go into a far country uh, to receive uh, the kingdom. This is, I think, in reference to like a Psalm 110, uh, verses 1 and 2. The, this, this is a parabolic uh, 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 connection uh, to the predictions that the Son of Man, Jesus, would die, and then he would ascend and for a time be away from here to receive the kingdom. So this is Psalm 110, verses 1 and 2. Uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool, that kind of thing. That, that's what this is. And so this parable deals with the period of time uh, between the ascension, the, the going away of, of the nobleman, Jesus, to receive the kingdom, and when he comes back, it doesn't fully develop the kingdom, but it's dealing with the servants. 
the servants who were still here doing the king's business. And when he comes back, he says, come here and tell me what you did. That's, that's the gist of this, uh, of, of this uh, parable. The 10 servants represent the totality of the servants. And if I could spell it out more clearly, that's us, believers, church people, those who have accepted Christ by faith. And we are instructed through this parable to occupy, that is to do business for God while the king is away getting his kingdom. He's going to come back. And when he returns, we'll give an account. All the, the servants do business after the nobleman departs. Um, and in contrast to that, you have the citizens. This is probably, pretty likely, a reference to the Jewish nation who rejected him. We don't want this man to be king over us. We will not have him be our king. And so the, the story ends with, with those, uh, those enemies being destroyed. And uh, there is a reference here, is it, is it an eschatological destruction or is this uh, AD 70 destruction of Jerusalem or, or, or somewhat both? Uh, we'll leave that open for, for discussion later. Uh, the nobleman's return in verse 15 uh, pictures the return of Christ to earth to set up his kingdom. And so I want to briefly work through this in about four areas. I've already done one of them. The reason for the parable is the delay. Uh, this time period in which you and I find ourselves, the church age, the, the inter-advent, in between advents, first and second, or interregnum periods, uh, it's the period of the church, and it's the time for service. It is the time for the church to exist, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, to worship and glorify him, but it is also a time of testing officers, testing servants, and their faithfulness for the coming kingdom as we await the return. The second one, and again rather briefly, um, is to give you a quick reminder of the reality of this kingdom. A quick reminder of the reality of this kingdom. This parable doesn't fully develop kingdom issues. That's, it's, that's the job of many parables, but let me give you a quick overview and I, this is one that is exciting to me and I think challenging for all of us. When, uh, even in our circles where we believe in the return of Christ and the rapture and so on, it, there is often a very vague um, idea of heaven and more specifically here of the kingdom. What is the kingdom like? And I'd, I'd heard a quote, I'd drawn a blank where the, the author, but it, it was speaking of the evangelical church saying, um, most of us, much of the church has an idea of heaven, of eternity, of the kingdom, uh, much like they view a West Texas highway. <laughs> Long, flat, and kind of vague. You know, this, you just go mile after mile. So, so you get all these strange ideas. I, I hope you don't have these of uh, sitting on clouds and playing harps or something like that. Some, something uh, that's not what this is about. The reminder, very quickly, of the, of the reality of the kingdom, um, the, not only is it real, this is, a, this is a kingdom parable about a real kingdom, but it, more than that, it is really a kingdom. <laughs> and so when we think of a kingdom, we have certain things in mind. And at the risk of, of uh, uh, making it too fantastical or something, it's a real kingdom. It certainly involves a king. It involves lords and nobles, it involves servants, it involves workers, it involves citizens, it involves all those kind of things. And what I'm getting at here is, if you're like me, uh, especially when I was a kid, teenager, and enjoyed reading like medieval stories, knights in shining armor, and uh, dukes and lords and nobles and battles and all those kind of things, uh, where there's a lord in a castle, and you can picture the castle, it has a moat and a drawbridge, and uh, guards in armor at the gate, and you get inside, and there's a blacksmith and a, a wagon right, and uh, you know a butcher baker and a candlestick maker, and all kinds of things. They're regular people, and I'm I'm here to suggest to you to think about this in a little bit more concrete terms. That when the kingdom comes, it is not some dreamy, ethereal. We just kind of sit and and think or emote. It's an actual kingdom with the king. In fact, the king is the king of all kings. I don't know, you probably have thought of this, I hope. What does that phrase imply? Well, centrally implies he is, he is majestic, he is wonderful, he is great. 
But think about it. If he is the king of all kings, what does that mean? There are other kings. There are lords and nobles. There is, I hate to use this word, there's a bureaucracy because we get wrong ideas. This is Jesus' bureaucracy. This is Jesus' government. This is Jesus' kingdom. But under the king, there are all kinds of people with responsibilities, and that's what this parable is about, and other ones like it. He is looking for officers to fill these positions. In fact, one author has written it this way, that this is the heart of this parable. Uh, he wrote it regarding these kind of parables, this one in particular. Thus we confront our crisis. Officers are required for the administration of a kingdom. The king's coming back. He has positions to fill. Officers are required for the administration of a kingdom. So God has deliberately interposed a prolonged period between the two advents, between Christmas, Calvary, and between the return of Christ in, uh, in his absence as to discover which people, which officers are fitted for which positions. Uh, positions of responsibility and trust at his return. The nobleman, before he departed, laid plans for the selection of officers to aid him in the administration of the kingdom. He devised the plan for bringing to light who those officers are on his return. This plan is in operation at the present moment, purposely so con contrived as to reveal individual capacity for office and personal fitness for trust. And, most impressive of all, the long journey, the long absence is now nearly over, and at any moment, the investigation, the accounting will begin. And so this parable, along with several others like it, is laying out the fact that the, the king, the nobleman left, he's going to receive a kingdom. That's Jesus. He will return, and now he's setting up the kingdom and its reality, the concreteness of a real kingdom. This parable, the centerpiece of it, is dealing with these servants and their accountability to him. So let me highlight a couple things for you. The role of the servants. This is number three, the role of the servants. In this delay period, that's us, that's the church, that's you and I, it is our job to do business for the king. And the reality, in this one, we're all given equal amounts, so there's some sense, probably, of equal opportunity to faithfully serve the Lord. It doesn't spell out what the minas are, the pounds, but he distributes them and says, go work for me, do my business. And the implication, the conclusion we draw is that each of us has an opportunity to serve the Lord. And we each have a responsibility then to stand before the Lord. This sounds like uh, the, the uh, Bama seat, does it not? The Lord returns and says, what have you done for me? And we say, here's what I've accomplished. This is what I've done. Here's my life. The key cornerstone, the chief metric of which is faithfulness. Have you served? And in fact, we see that in the first two servants. Uh, you notice in verse 16, first, the first servant came before the nobleman, the Lord, uh, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. He had worked hard. He had done a lot. He had actually accomplished much. And the master said, verse 17, well done, good servant. Well done, good servant. Why was the Lord pleased? What made this servant a good servant? The next phrase. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. The second one comes very similar. He doesn't, in this one, he doesn't say, well done, but he says, uh, I made five. The, the Lord answers, you are to be over five cities. There is a proportionate uh, reward. And so there is, uh, we are called, the servants represent us, Christians, church people in this era, who have been each, all, called of God to serve him and do his business. And your responsibility in business is going to be different than mine. We're different people. You know, one of my chief ones is to be faithful in pastoring. Uh, yours is something else. But each of us is called to be faithful to God where we are with what he has given us. Now the crux, and it looks like I am going to dip into the kitty a couple minutes, uh, the crux, the rub of this parable is that third servant. And we approach that in verse number 20 and following, and there the first two have done well, and they're given responsibility, they're given increased responsibilities in proportion to their service. The third servant, the third steward comes in and says, 
I was afraid of you. You're an austere man. You, you seem to get your way no matter what. Uh, so I just kind of tucked this away. Here it is. And, and the, the story, as we read it, and you know it, says the Lord, the nobleman, is not pleased. He is unhappy. In fact, the wording, this is why people get nervous with this, but the wording is in verse, uh, he says, I kept in a handkerchief. Here it is. I was afraid of you. Verse 22, the master said to the third servant, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. Uh, and again, my time's going to run short here, but in, in several of these parables, this one and the one in Matthew, here's the challenge. All three are servants. This is the problem. And I'm going to, because of time, let me just develop it very quickly, my conclusion. The third servant is as much a servant as the first two. There's no textual way to get around that. To put it more bluntly, if the first two are saved servants of Jesus, so is the third one. The third guy is a saved guy. Uh, we can try and dismiss it. Oh, that is a wicked guy. Uh, you know, no, he's wicked in his service. He's wicked as a servant, not being faithful. And so the challenge here, this is the part that is not necessarily comforting or encouraging. It is more uh, encouraging, rebuking. If you are here today and know Christ as Savior, uh, you're born again, but you have really not been serving the Lord, this third servant is a warning to you. That when we get to that point, when you get to that point of standing before the Lord, each of us is going to give an answer, what have I done for Jesus? And if the answer is, I just think Christian living is hard. I think Jesus is a, is a tough master, and so I just did my own thing. It is not going to be a pleasant interview. It has nothing to do with losing salvation. Let me just to set that aside. But it has everything to do with future service in the kingdom for the king. And this guy's prospects for that are dim. In fact, if you read it just literally, if you read it this way it is, what he had in this life, one mina, is what? It's actually taken away. He has less in glory to serve the Lord with than he does now. And so the challenge here is faithfulness and service. The, the concluding idea here for us, and, and I'll wrap up with this, um, we've done the reckoning of the, of the servants. The idea here is that we have an opportunity to serve the Lord today. Whatever your place in life is, you're a father, you're a mother, uh, there, there are pastors here. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. God has called each of us and given us something to work with, uh, whatever it is, your time, your talent, your abilities, your resources, and we have an equal opportunity to serve the Lord with what we have. And then we will stand before, when the Lord returns, I think this is Bema seat stuff, he comes back and he says, come tell me what you have done. How have you served me? And we want to be able to say, Lord, I have worked hard for you. I have been faithful. And so it is a faithfulness that is at the center of this. Faithfulness to the word of God. Faithfulness to, to the Lord himself. Uh, faithfulness to the principles of Scripture in living out the Christian life. There's quite a bit more here, but our time has come to a close. I want to encourage you in that uh, it is not, you know, are you the best known person? Do you have a, you know, do you have a huge following on your blog? Uh, you have more than one YouTube channel in which you influence millions of people for Christ, <laughs> uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's not that. Is it, it's definitely not uh, how much money did you make. <laughs> Uh, it's not, uh, you know, a lot of other things, but it is, have you been faithful to follow Jesus Christ? And that we can do. Remember, I can almost hear my, my dad's words. Maybe even you remember him, Paul Augustine. A lot of things I can't do. I can't guarantee this, that, or the other. My talents are average. But we, each of us, I can do it too. I can be faithful to Jesus today, and I can get ready to be faithful tomorrow, and I can do it again the next day. May God help us to be that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the goodness of the Lord. We look forward to the return of the King. And we pray for each of us. It would be a joy to stand before you. We know we have faults. We know we've failed in ways uh, every day, probably. But we pray that the trajectory of our lives, we would commit ourselves to faithful service here and now, that someday, uh, as we stand before the Lord, we would give him the glory and hear him say, well done. 
To that end, we commit ourselves. Be with us as we conclude this conference, give safety in traveling as we go to different churches tomorrow and gather in our local assemblies. May you be glorified. May the sun be lifted up in our hearts and uh, encourage us in our walk, again, to be faithful to you until you come back. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.